Uh, okay, I'm very happy to welcome Olivia Roy. Olivia is the chair of logic and philosophy at Bayreuth University, and he has worked in many different areas in these fields, including <clears throat> philosophy of action, dynamic epistemic logics, the ontic logic, formal epistemology, and social choice theory, and their connection to philosophy of economics and political theory. And today, Olivia will talk to us about deliberation, coherent aggregation, and anchoring. Olivia, the screen is yours. Thanks, Sosh. Let me uh, share my screen. Um, okay. All right. So, welcome, everybody, uh, and uh, thanks for inviting me for this talk. So what I present today is actually uh, joint work, uh, uh, mainly I had the privilege to work with Soush uh, on this uh, and I, the most of the results I present uh, I've been uh, obtained in, in close collaboration with him and more recently there's a master student from economics uh, here at the University of Bayreuth who has worked with us, uh, Mahe Habuzaid, uh, who was also responsible for some of the results that I will be presenting. Um, yes, so deliberation, coherent aggregation, and uh, anchoring. I'm, so this is, since this is a somewhat, somewhat, as I understand, interdisciplinary audience, uh, I will not assume that you know much about um, the background of this work or, or where we're starting from. So I'll take a little bit more time uh, to uh, explain you that and then present you like what we did and, and why we did it. So the, the starting point is something which is quite well known, uh, especially so in social choice theory, um, is the idea that uh, certain form of voting, uh, especially if you vote and you submit preference ranking over a number of alternatives, can uh, yield incoherent, so maybe cyclic or intransitive group preferences, so preference of the group, uh, even though each of the individual preferences are themselves coherent. So you, you get collective incoherence out of individual incoherence through the aggregation method. And this is a typical example of that. So how to read these graphs. So we have three agents, we have Han, Bob, and Charlie. Um, and there are three alternatives, A, B, and C. And uh, what's marked by these lines are the preferences. So uh, and least, least preferred outcome is A, the middle one is B, and our most preferred, preferred outcome is C. Bob ranks equally um, A and B, uh, and below that is C. And uh, Charlie's best option is A, uh, and ranks equally B and C. And uh, what matters here is not the numbers, it's really just the ranking. Uh, so whether an option is, is more or less preferred than the others. So <clears throat> one way to, so we want to know what is the collective, what, what the group consisting of Anne, Bob, and Charlie prefers. And one way to do it is called pairwise majority voting. So what we do on each pair of alternative A and B, say we look what the majority prefers on this alternative. Uh, and the collective ranking is the one that's obtained by uh, putting together all these pairwise judgment. Now, if you look, for example, at the pair A and B, you will notice that while well, we have two agents who consider um, A, well, let's, let's start with B, who considers B at least as good as A. And by at least as good, I mean, uh, either strictly better or equal. So uh, we have uh, Anne, Anne thinks that B is actually strictly better than A. And we have Bob who thinks they're at least as good because he's indifferent between A and B, right? So we have two out of three, right? So there's majority that says A is at least as good as B, but there's also a majority, a different one, which considers, uh, sorry, there's a majority that considers B at least as good as A, but there is also a majority that considers A at least as good as B. A different one, uh, of course, Bob is still there, all right? So he's indifferent, but now Charlie's preference come into the picture because Charlie considers A actually strictly better than B, right? So the majority preference goes both ways. So the majority is indifferent. So there's a majority for A 
at least as good as B and the majority for B at least as good as A. So the group judgment will be an indifference between those if you do better words majority. Same for B and C, right? This is the same pattern, right? So, uh, so we have a majority that considers B at least as good as C, right? We have Bob who thinks that B is actually strictly better and Charlie was indifferent and same in the other way, right? Um, but actually A is not strictly, uh, A is not indifferent to C. So indifference is not transitive in this, um, in this setup uh, because we have two agents who think that A is strictly better than C, right? So we have, Bob and Charlie, right? So they both consider A strictly better uh, than C. So this is a typical example where pairwise majority voting leads to an incoherent, in a sense of intransitive, so the indifference relation of the group is intransitive um, judgment or preference, even though each of the individual preferences are perfectly coherent. So they are transitive and um, complete in this case. Now, we know from Arrow's theorem that this is not something which is specific to this particular aggregation method that I use, so pairwise majority voting in this case. But this applies to a much larger uh, uh, family of aggregation rules, so these sort of problems. Uh, that, and, and Arrow's is an axiomatic approach, so he, he provides a number of intuitive requirements on aggregation. Uh, rules and he shows that no aggregation rules satisfies them all. For us, the thing that will be important, two of those important requirements are rationality and universal domain. So rationality says that uh, you want your output preference or so the group preference to be a complete pre-order, so transitive uh, and complete, possibly with some indifference. Um, but you don't want to have incomparable or intransitive or cyclic uh, um, rankings. And universal domain, which says that um, any input should be acceptable, right? So any profile of preferences uh, among the voters or the participant should be uh, uh, acceptable by your aggregation rule. So there's nothing excluded. Now, these are the two off. There's other conditions, uh, not, uh, <clears throat> notoriously independence of a relevant alternative. But for us, those these are the one today that uh, will be focused on rationality and universal domain. So we have this possibility. There's a problem, and, and many, especially in political uh, theory, I've seen that as a, I've seen results like Arrow's theorem as really threatening our very idea of, of democratic. Uh, legitimacy or, or the role we should ascribe to uh, democratic procedures. So now the question is, how can we escape this sort of problem or this kind of incoherence that comes with uh, pairwise majority voting in particular or Arovian aggregation methods in general? And it's been <clears throat> observed very early on, so by Arrow himself, but also by Black a little bit earlier, um, that we can restrict avoid that sort of problem by restricting the domain. So you remember in the previous slide, I said one of the Arovian condition is called universal domain, any input is acceptable. But if we drop that assumption and restrict the domain to so-called single peak preferences, uh, we can avoid the problem. So what are single peak preference? Well, let's start with thinking about them for one agent. So. A single peak preference uh, is, a, is always relative to a given dimension or ordering or alternative. So um, very often you might, uh, the example that's given is uh, you could order the uh, say candidates in an election according to the left to, or left to right dimension, right? So which one is more to the left, which one is more to the right uh, or um, authoritarian versus democratic well, ideas like that. So. A single peak preference is always relative to a given dimension. And so suppose my, I have four alternative, A, B, C, and D, like it's in this example. Um, now the blue line here represents one preference, which is single peak. And what does it mean to be single peak? Well, indeed there is a peak here, right? And if I go left or right to that peak on that dimension, and right? it's very important the dimension is there for that. If I go left or right on that dimension, then I always strictly go down, right? So, and the further I go, the down, the lower I get. 
So the red agent on this picture is not single peaked, it's single dipped, but okay. Uh, but it's, it's not single peak, right? Because of course, so if I start here, for example, and I go left then I first go down and then I go up again. Right, so that's not a single peak uh, preference. Now, this is for individual preference ranking given a particular ordering of the alternatives. Um, but we see that the group or a profile of preferences is single peak if I can find a ranking, an underlying dimension such that all the rankings in that group are single peak. So, here, for example, right are two, so the red agent is not single peak regarding to the, uh, with respect to the A, B, C, and D ranking uh, dimension. But if I flip D, right? So if instead I put D at the beginning and then A, B, and C, then that ranking is single peak. So you might check quick, uh, if you, you could check quickly if you want, but the preference relations are the same on both sides. The only thing I did, and I swapped the orders, right? I put D at the beginning, and A, B, and C afterwards. So this profile, so these two preferences are single peak, even though they're not single peak according to the A, B, C, and D right, uh, dimension, because I can reorder the alternative in such a way that they're all single peak. So this is why uh, this one is illustrated on the left. Now, what's important for us is that, so what arrow, what black and arrow observed a long time ago is that, um, if the preferences are single peak, then the sort of problem that are um, uh, that arise from Arrow, Arrow's theorem or pairwise majority voting uh, do, are avoided. So we can avoid that kind of problem by focusing on single peak preference. But of right, course- can, can I ask a question? Yeah. So, but is this guaranteed for any possible choice? Yeah. Yeah, so but we you know can always, you can always order such that. No, 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 right, exactly. So that's why it's a restriction of the domain, right? Okay. So if you restrict your domain to groups that have single peak preference, then you know, and, and, and this is a, a proper restriction, right? So, and, and this, we know it's the, the, the single peak domain has been characterized and it's a proper subset of all possible preference profile, right? So this is a substantial restriction. And right, okay. that's why the next question comes to the picture right away. Um, when can we expect it to happen, right? So, uh, and this is this is exactly where, where I'm going. So can we escape, right? So can we avoid those problems? When can we assume that they're single peak? And one uh, quite prominent view in political philosophy and in political theory is uh, that we can do that through deliberation. So instead of just taking, letting people vote, if we let the voters talk to each other before the thought is, uh, they will end up having preferences. So they will change their preferences by exchanging their opinion and they will end up having single peak preferences. So this is, has been prominently, it's an idea that's been around for a while, but it's been prominently uh, advocated by Liss and Dreizig, uh, in this 2003 paper, which is cited down there. So let me be a bit more precise about this. So the research, because that's really what grounds or the starting point of, of socialized uh, work on this question. So the received view is really that uh, <clears throat> deliberation, so letting people exchange opinion prior to voting, help us avoid the kind of incoherent or irrational group preferences that I was uh, pointing at earlier. Because it does one thing, it fosters what they call meta agreement. And meta agreement, they claim in turn, will uh, produce single peak preference. So the question is, what is, meta, what is a meta agreement? Well, essentially it's an agreement on what matters. So, and it doesn't mean that we agree on who is act, on what is actually the best option. So let, let me take a, a classical example, um, or maybe, <clears throat> yeah, let me take a classical example. So you have a hiring committee uh, and um, uh, there's a number of candidates we were a strong disagreement of, on to which candidate is the best, but we all agree that we should try to weight or to balance teaching uh, portfolio and research output. Right? We think this is what matter. Right? Uh, we might strongly disagree on what is the best way to strike that balance. Right? I might think like teaching is, is most important. So a, a candidate which has better teaching portfolio should be ranked higher than another one. 
one of my colleagues might think this is research. Some might think this is 50-50, so somebody like in the middle. <clears throat> so we still might disagree quite a lot. We might even have completely opposite preferences, but still we might agree on what matters, right? So this is what a meta agreement is. And, and the idea by dry second list is that deliberation help us to figure out really those dimensions that are salient or, or important for all of us, right? So if we talk with each other, we at least realize that. Um, and that they claim once we've realized that, <clears throat> we can come back to this in the Q&A, but they claim that this is irrational on the basis of that to have preferences that are not single peak. So if, <clears throat> or to put it the other way around, and they claim that if you really think a particular dimension is what matters, uh, and there are two peaks on, on, your preferences have two peaks on, on that dimension, it must be because there's something else that matters to you. It's not only that dimension, there is something else, right? So that's the argument. We can talk about that also uh, more in the Q&A. Now, <clears throat> that's what- Sorry, yeah. can I ask a question? So, yeah. so I, I should see single peakness as something that emerges or, or something that appears at late, late time, like a kind of steady state late time? Yeah, so the claim is that if we, if we talk long enough, yeah. right, yeah. We, we come to have this, uh, realize what's really mad important for all of us, we reach this meta agreement. And from there, if we think a little bit more, they think individually, then you will realize that your individual preference should be single peak with respect to that, um, that dimension, right? So, um, so if you go back to the hiring committee example, so once you've accepted that what you should balance is the teaching versus research uh, output, then what you will do is um, find which point on that scale is the best you think is the best personally and align your preference on that, right? So this essentially process sort of the conceptual, uh, that's the, what I call here the conceptual argument, right? So it's, it's the intuitive process that they, they postulate is actually happening. Yeah, but, 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 how, but how are you going to show this? So you, you're going to put this on some kind of network and give some rules? And, uh, and yeah, so I, I, I think Val had the question, I, but that's something I want to come okay. back to okay. uh, in, in one second. So Val, your hand. Yeah, no, thank you. I just want to clarify something. So, uh, I mean, naively thinking, it seems that the liberation would not always lead to such a, yeah. such a solution because basically instead of arguing about the alternatives or, 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 or deciding, then the preferences are about the criteria. And so yeah. there seems to be some circularity here. Am I yeah. confused or? Yeah, yeah. I mean, this is this is a worry uh, that, that has been voiced. Uh, so maybe let, let me just present the evidence that's there for, right? So what I provided to you now is a conceptual, just a conceptual agreement, how this might happen, right? And, and you might find it plausible or, or, or not, right? So Val, I think that, that you, you think, no, this actually creates more problems than it helps. Yeah. Um, so there is still a gap here, right? Already, if we think about that. Now, there is some empirical evidence that this is indeed happening. And this is what's, uh, this is the second paper that's quoted in there. And there's a follow-up paper uh, a couple of years. Well, funny enough, I think the follow-up paper po was published a year before because it took ages to, <laughs> to publish that one. But the, what they did in the empirical work, so they look at, at uh, well, I mean, it takes very special data to measure that, right? On the one hand, you need the preferences before and after deliberation, which you rarely have, but they, so they took cases where you have that um, <clears throat> and they measured uh, meta agreement or they use a proxy for measuring meta agreement prior and after the deliberation by looking at are, are certain dimensions were already salient or became salient in the course of deliberation. So that's what they did, and they found some correlation. I mean, it's it's not super strong, but it is statistically significant between that proxy and um, uh, getting closer to single peak preference uh, in those cases. So there is some empirical evidence, but it's, it's very punctual, right? So this one, you can see there's already one motivation for doing what we did, what Solution I did, is that we, we essentially did some simulation model to see whether we could find uh, simulation evidence that this is actually happening the way they um, <coughs> they uh, suggested. Right. Clear? Yeah. Okay. Good. So 
Um, so let me just be cl clarify a little bit what this receive view is, because that's really important also for what's coming uh, next. So there's two claim in there. Uh, First of all, there's a claim regarding the effect of the liberation. So the effect is that it creates, at the end of the day, single peakness and or single peak preference, and that avoids. So that is a mathematical result. If you have single peak preference, you know that you're going to avoid the kind of incoherent group reference that I was mentioning. So that's a claim about the effect, but there's also a claim about the mechanism that leads to that effect. And that's what's called the meta agreement hypothesis is that this happens through the creation of meta agreements within the group. Uh, and, and what does the result that Solution and I have obtained, they, they sort of go at qualifying. I think these, these, this receive view both regarding the effect and the mechanism should be qualified in view of the results that we have. And of course, you might ask yourself, so is it a claim about like real, how actual deliberations take place or are actual ideal uh, deliberation uh, should or would take place? Um, and that second case is also important because deliberation has also played a fundamental role in, in uh, normative foundations of uh, democratic theory and also in ethics. Uh, and so what should I view what we do really as, as addressing the, the normative question? So what would happen in the ideal case and whether this hypothesis can be sustained also in the ideal case? Uh, but again, we can discuss that in the Q&A. We did actually compare our results with the empir empirical data or run our simulations using the empirical data uh, that is there as input. So we can also talk about that later on if you want. So, but why, so why revisit the, the receive view in the first place? Well, um, thing is that the situation is a little bit more subtle than it looks uh, 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 from the, at the start. So on the one hand, the results that I were mentioning from Black and Harrow, they hold for strict preferences. So the, the case where you're not allowed to be indifferent between a certain alternative, right? So saying I, I'm A is actually, I'm indifferent between A and B, right? So you have to have a strict ranking between A and B. Um, <clears throat> and if we weaken single peakness to weak, so if we generalize single peakness to the case where you are allowed to be indifferent, so weak rankings, um, then the, the natural generalization of that so with weak single peakness, uh, does not ensure coherent preferences. It ensures acyclic preferences, so that's good. So your, your strict preference won't be cyclic, um, but it does not ensure intransitive preference. It actually, the example that I gave you at the beginning is an, is an instance of that, right? Where you have uh, <clears throat> weakly single peak preferences, but uh, still an intransitive uh, group ranking. So one popular alternative in the social choice literature is so-called single plateau uh, preference, which is strengthening of weak single peak. And what single plateau does is that it only allows you to be indifferent at the top of the ordering. Uh, and it rules out being completely indifferent. So in, in this example, for instance, well, Anne's preference are, of course, their single plateau. Bob's preference is single plateau with respect to the ABC ranking, but Charlie is not. Right. Why is that? Because she's indifferent between B and C, right? And that's not at the top of her ordering. So single plateau rules that out, it, and also ruled being completely ruled completely indifferent. <clears throat> now, in the paper, and again, we can discuss that. We take issue with that in the sense that we find that the the, the conceptual argument that I was sketching from Dreisigen list for single peak preference even if you grant that meta agreement can lead to single peak preference, it's not clear at all that it can lead to this stronger notion that we that is used uh, in the case of, of weak preference, namely single plateau. Uh, so the question is, why is it irrational to have to be indifferent uh, outside of your, your uh, of the peak or uh, to be completely indifferent between the other thing? What's the problem with that? And we really don't see it. So, so the, the, then the, the question is, um, can we still assume, can, is it still the case? Can we still find support for uh, this idea that deliberation can create, what can avoid incoherent outcome, uh, group preference through the creation of single plateau preference, right? not just single being with single plateau preference. Can we find evidence for that? And that's our starting question uh, for, for this work. 
And as I was saying, um, well, it's very difficult to find empirical evidence uh, or empirical data that, that is rich enough. I mean, you have to find a voting in the first place where people submit full rankings, which is not happening often. Well, yeah, uh, I have a question. Yeah. Um, but before finding empirical evidence, is there any conceptual reason to expect single plateau except that it's nice mathematically? Yeah. Because if for single picked, um, I have a reason. Well, Chris, uh, Chris yeah. uh, pro pro provides a reason which can be formalized. Yeah. I have a paper. Yeah. Essentially, um, it's like if you accept this common dimension as the yeah. things that matter, then uh, essentially you form your preferences by uh, picking a salient point. Yeah, exactly. Like, these exactly. are this is the top of my preference, and everything else is down downhill yeah. from there. Yeah. Right? It's yeah. Like yeah. I yeah. like that particular combination of exactly. qualities. This is my ideal candidate, and everything else is worse than that. And then. It's natural to be single pity if, if these yeah. are the, your criteria. But for single plateau, I don't see any such conceptual reason to, to just say I cannot be indifferent no. on the on the top or all, and in addition on the yeah. bottom. Why not? Yeah. I mean, I have two candidates well, yeah. and two bottom ones. So what? Well, there's nothing irrational about that. No, I, I totally agree. I mean, this is just this this is this is the starting point for us, right? So we think to the extent that there is a conceptual agreement for single peakness, it doesn't transfer to single plateau, right? And the, now the, the next question is, well, does it happen anyway, right? So that's that, that's the question we're asking, right? Uh, and if yes, then the next question, and that's one we're, we're still thinking about is why, right? So, uh, but, um, so it, it will turn out under a certain condition, it does happen uh, in our model. Uh, but the question is, is why should that be the case? Uh, or <laughs> why is it the case? But I mean, I, I'm totally with you on that. Uh, uh, and that's what we say very explicitly in the paper. Uh, it's not clear at all that the conceptual argument transfers, right? Uh, and then things like indifference outside of the top or full indifference is, is ruled out or why should that be ruled out, right? It's not clear. Yeah. Okay, so, um, so as I said, so there is very little empirical evidence. Uh, and so what we, what we do instead, we uh, actually, build model and look at true computational simulations uh, of uh, what is happening. Uh, uh, so we have a model of deliberation and we look whether yeah, under that model, we can see things like single plateau uh, arise. So what is the model? Um, so, well, we have a bunch of individuals and individuals um, <clears throat> and they're, they come in the, the deliberation with a preference ranking. Most of our simulations are done for three alternatives. We're not the only one uh, who've done that. Most of the uh, simulation and uh, some of the analytical work is on three alternatives. It becomes quickly intractable uh, for more, uh, but we are actually looking at the case of more alternatives. So this, this master student that I was talking about uh, at the very beginning, Maher uh, is working on, on, on that case as well right now. And I'll say more about that uh, later on. Uh, so, but well, now we'll focus on the case of three alternatives. <clears throat> and what happened is that the way we have a very minimal model of deliberation, the group members come in, they announce their preference, or one person announced their preference, the other update their preferences in a way that I will explain in a minute. And then the next one announced our, pref our updated preference, the other update, and so on, right? This is just a simple model we have. So, <clears throat> Deliberations is organized in rounds in this model. Each round consists of n step, one for each agent. So one, each, each participant speaks once and only once in one round. Um, and the way it works, as I was saying, one person speaks, the other, all the others update. And then the next person speaks, expresses our updated ranking and so on. Uh, and the order of speak is uh, reassigned randomly at each round. So we reshuffle at each round just to make sure it doesn't really hinges on, on the order of speech. Now the question, the main question is how is the update going on? We go through uh, distance minimization. I will explain that in a minute. And we let deliberation continues for a fixed number of rounds. But uh, as it turns out, deliberation stabilized very fast in those model. So uh, the number of rounds typically is, is, is not so high, but we can let it continue as long as we want. <clears throat> um, so the update, as I was saying, we're proceeding through distance minimization. What we're minimizing is actually a weighted distance, right? So first, let me say something about distance. Um, so there are a number of distance measures that are 
available on the literature in the literature on uh, distance between preference ranking. There are three salient ones, uh, salient for a number of reasons, but for us, since we're working on a normative uh, perspective, they're salient because their their axiomatization is well known and well studied. Uh, and uh, so these are the Kemeny Snell distance, the Cook-Cypher distance, and the Duddy Piggins distance. We use all three just to make sure it doesn't hinge on the very specifics of all of them, but at least at the axiomatic level, they're very close to one another. Um, so what these distance measures are doing, so they measure distance between rankings. The, the oldest one is probably the Kemeny Snell measure. And it's essentially a Hemming distance, right? You, you count the number of flips you need to do from trans to transfer one ranking uh, into the other. The Duddy Piggins distance uh, is similar to the Kemeny Snell. So it's really a close cousin, except what it does is that, so Kemeny Snell does some double counting. Uh, so for example, so if your preference are transitive and you know what the preference on a, over on A and B are and B and C, then it imposes constraint on what are your preferences on B and C. So there's an additional switch that you don't really need to do if you keep transitivity. Uh, Kemeny Snell counts that as an extra switch. Duddy Piggins doesn't. Right? So that's essentially what's going on. Cook cipher is slightly different. It assigns numbers and it um, uh, it uh, measures distance on the basis of that. So if you know social choice theory, this is closer to the board account. Uh, so you assign numbers to the alternative and you uh, <clears throat> look at distance in terms of the, uh, the sum of the absolute distance between those. Now, the details of that are not really important for us. What matter is really that what we do, we measure the, as I was saying, the weighted distance. And it's really crucial for us here. So we allow the diff each of the participants to be bias in such a way, so to speak, towards their own opinion. So we want them to be able to view themselves as at least, or maybe more of an expert or on the particular questions uh, than anybody else. Uh, or if you don't want to think of it in terms of expertise, you can think of it about in terms of cognitive inertia. So it doesn't need to be like a reflexive uh, conscious process. Uh, they might just, uh, be a little bit more stubborn or a little bit less open-minded. So when they hear an opinion from the other, they might be less prone to move towards their opinion. So there's different ways to identify this bias parameter, but it's something important for us because we want to uh, be able to explore what are the consequences of being, for instance, less or more uh, open-minded. Sorry, so, so you give a, one of these bias parameters for each of the agents? Is that yeah, so that's, that, was my, that was my next point. So we made two very important simplifying assumptions. Uh, we started to look at lifting them, but uh, the results are very preliminary. But very, very, simp very important simplifying assumption. So first of all, we assume that each agent assigns the same uh, bias to everybody, uh, has the same bias towards everybody else. So it's me versus the others, right? So uh, I assign a particular value between zero and one to me. And for any other opinions that I hear, then the bias value is one minus my bias, right? Okay. So that's for each agent. And we also assume that this is the same for everybody, right? So, so basically everybody sees themselves. And as you will see from, from the um, simulation, uh, we always start at one half. So one half is the case where you think about the others as peers, right? So they're equally as uh, experts or, or you're equally, you should you really go halfway. Um, and then we only go up from that. So if going down really just reverse the result. So we only go up from that and up means, so for example, a bias of 0.75 means uh, you consider yourself twice as an expert uh, as anybody else. Right? So this is, this is the idea and everybody's like that. Right? So this is a very strong simplifying assumption. As I was saying, we're looking at uh, uh, lifting it uh, right now, but for the results here, we're just keeping at that. Okay. Uh, so what we do, we let this model run. Uh, and we measure, we measure two things at the end. So first of all, we measure so-called proximity to single peakness. So it's a standard measure in that literature. So that's the relative size of the largest subgroup, which is a uh, single plateau or single peak. So we look at the different subgroups and the largest subgroup in uh, our group of agents, which is single peak with respect to a particular, so where, for which we can find a dimension under which uh, the, subgroup is single peak or single plateau 
we look at all of those in the large, well, we don't really look at all of those, but so we found a smarter way to calculate that, but uh, essentially we, that's what we, we find. And this is the, the so-called proximity to single peakness. And we check whether the resulting profile would lead to uh, an intransitive or cyclic uh, preference ordering for the group using pairwise majority voting. Okay, so that's what we, that's the model. Let's look at the results now. So, sorry, can I ask you just, just yeah. a question? Because I didn't get uh, one point. So, so it, an agent presents their ordering, or yeah. you say her ordering, and then you measure the distance between that and other preferences from yours. Other. Yeah, right. But but then how do you update? Yeah, so you you find so you you announce your ordering. I'm listening. Uh, then what I find is the ranking which minimize distance this weighted distance between your ranking and my ranking uh, and if there are more than typically very often there will be more than one uh, then i just randomize uh, so I, I just pick one among that so this is very this is what's happening and everyone is doing that individually right it's not that we're waiting until everybody has spoken and then we update we just update on the basis of okay he, she said that this is what i find right so mm -hmm. um, yeah so this is the update procedure. So, <clears throat> the, so let's look at the results. On the one hand, we find actually quite, uh, well, we find some support for the hypothesis that deliberation creates not only single peak, but single, um, oh, sorry, that's before going to single plateau. We find some evidence that deliberation actually eliminates this sort of intransitive uh, or, or incoherent group references. So what you what shows is this graph is the proportion of intransitive or incoherent group references that are remaining after deliberation. So zero is good, right? Because they're, they're all coherent, it means. And you can see that up to 0.73 bias um, Essentially, uh, deliberation completely eliminates uh, um, <coughs> intransitive group preference, and there, there were a substantial amount of them uh, at the beginning, right? so that we're starting with zero. Um, <clears throat> so, again, we could talk about that. We make a couple of assumptions to make the likelihood of uh, intransitive preference at the beginning as high as possible, right? So, and we use a number of analytical results for that. Now, there's also interesting that happened above that, uh, so beyond that bracket, the so 50 to 73. So you can see what's happening here, all these peaks, right? Uh, they are above one. So it means that be in this bracket between 73 and something like 95, 97, depending on the measure, um, deliberation does not eliminate incoherent uh, group preferences. It actually tends to create them. Right, so uh, we get so here, for example, two hundred percent increase, four hundred percent, five hundred percent. So it's actually not; it doesn't help avoid. Uh, we find that uh, <clears throat> on av on average, so across our simulations, uh, there are more cycle well, intensive group preferences at the end of uh, deliberation for this bracket range uh, than there were at the beginning. Well, so which is quite an interesting finding because it's actually for that bracket range it puts into question the effect part of the uh, received view that deliberation actually does eliminate incoherent group preference so for low biases or like up to 73 75 it doesn't it does the, the hypothesis is supported but afterward not necessarily um now of course the question is for these low biases um does it happen is it this is this elimination coming tr coming through or coming about because or at least together with uh an increase uh in proximity to single plateauness um and for two of our three measures the answer is yes right so for uh both uh cook cipher and kevin e. snell uh, we see so the blue line is the average starting proximity to single weakness which by the way, it was sort of a surprise for us, but it's actually very close to the empirical results as well. Um, but we see that deliberation actually substantially increased for low bias proximity to single peakness, but not for Duddy Piggins. So that's also interesting uh, because, uh, so Duddy Piggins, we see a decrease in proximity of single peakness. This is systematic and quite robust. So it's not just for, for these particular parameter values. And still 
I mean, if you remember from the previous slide, uh, despite this decrease in proximity to single platonis, um, the liberation still avoids uh, incoherent or eliminates all uh, incoherent uh, group profile. So the connection between, uh, so the mechanism part, right? The, the, the link between single peak and uh, avoidance of um, incoherent group reference is looser than the uh, received view uh, might suggest. Also interesting, and, and also in that direction, if we go above, so in the bracket range where deliberation actually creates uh, uh, transitive or incoherent group preference, we can see that uh, for Kevin E. Snell, for example, it still increase. Uh, so this happens despite an increase in proximity to single platonis. Uh, and um, for uh, Cook Cipher, well, it's, it's this very slight increase, not much, or even a decrease for some value, but this is the area where actually group preferences uh, are not necessarily coherent or even they tend to be incoherent. So that's also interesting. So it's really loosened up the connection between on the one hand, um, single platonis or the create the sort of extended hypothesis that deliberation creates single plateau and um, the idea that uh, deliberation avoids uh, incoherent group preference. Um, in the interest of time, I'll just skip this one. Um, so, of course, you might ask yourself, right? So, is really is deliberation really efficient in the sense that it? Uh, I mean, now what I just said, I said on average it tends to create single peak preference or single plateau preference for certain uh, bracket range, certain bias range. Sorry, but you might think, well, maybe it does so for profiles that were not incoherent in the first place. So, how useful is that? Uh, well, so this this graph showed that it is actually pretty useful. So this just showed the proportion of rank of rankings that started as collectively incoherent and ended up uh, single plateau and coherent, uh, and that uh, up to quite high bias, especially for Kemeny Snell. This is almost all of them. So they all uh, all of those that started in transitive ended up uh, transitive, which means, given that some are created, that actually some who started coherent became incoherent in the course of deliberation, which is also uh, interesting. Um, this is less so for uh, Duddy Piggins, but you remember Duddy Piggins also decreased the proximity to single peakness, uh, single platonis, so this is not very surprising, and also for Cook Cipher. Okay. Um, now, as I was saying, these results, so just to, to, to wrap up these results, so we have on the one hand, some support for the idea that deliberation creates not only single peak, but single plateau preference, which was a surprise for us. So it goes even more uh, and creates this condition, which at least uh, intuitively is not something which is required rationally of you. Um, <clears throat> but on the other hand, we also need to qualify because for higher bracket uh, of biases, uh, deliberation actually does not uh, avoid incoherent aggregation, actually it tends to uh, create uh, inco incoherent group preference. As I was saying, this is for three alternatives. The question is what happened with more alternatives. Uh, so I was saying, so Maya Habuzait, a uh, current uh, MA student uh, in Bayreuth, is looking into the robustness for five alternatives or more. So he actually, uh, <clears throat> we we're not aware, we looked quite hard for it. We did, we're not aware of a way to calculate those distances uh, uh, for any number of agents uh, and uh, any number of alternatives automatically. So Maher implemented that. And uh, our original code was in Java, it translated on, in Python. <clears throat> and the results are starting to coming out, to come out. So he is actually writing his thesis right now, but they look promising. So here's a small sample. Um, so one thing that you observe already in that sample is that, uh, and that seems among the results that he obtained, um, that seems to be quite robust as well, that this creation of incoherent profiles that we were observing with a three alternative case is much less pronounced if there are more alternatives. So, um, so there is much less of that. Uh, and so that suggests, but that's still something we need to understand better. That suggests that actually this might have been an artifact of the three alternative case where there's so little places to move, so to speak. So, so very few, so that the space where the agents can move when they choose which ranking minimizes is actually very small. So if, if 
if you have three alternatives, there's 13 weak rankings. Uh, there's not many of them. Right? Um, so we're looking at the results right now, but <clears throat> computation, well, it's the way we're doing it right now is a, a, a memory demanding. So um, I think Maher made some calculation that for, uh, <clears throat> We would need something like one terabyte of RAM just for uh, 10 alternatives. So we need to find a smarter way to, to do this, but uh, this is in the process. Okay. So um, now let me just before moving to, uh, so in this, I want to say a few words also about anchoring. So let me just present you quickly what is me, what these results mean we take for the meta agreement hypothesis or the received view. Uh, so observe that. There is no meta agreement in our model, and actually, it's actually difficult to operationalize uh, because so you remember, single plateau and S or single peak mean there is a shared there's a dimension in which uh, according to which we're all single peak or single plateau, but meta agreement is a much more it's a softer notion which just says we agree there's this thing that we all recognize right and of course, you might think that single that meta agreement implies a single peak. But it, the other way around is not true. So we could have single peak reference uh, without having, uh, because maybe we don't even, this, this axis that, or this dimension that supports meta agreement is something which doesn't correspond to any intuitive uh, ranking of the alternative. <clears throat> so, so there's no meta agreement in our model. It's not clear how to implement that or how to, to operationalize that. Um, so this means that we can view our results are either complementary or uh, an alternative to uh, the received view. On the complementary part, what you might think is, OK, perhaps deliberation indeed creates meta agreement. As we observed earlier, this is intuitively not enough to give you single plateau, not just single peak, but single plateau. But possibly, I mean, what's new in our model, which has not been discussed very much in that literature, is this rational policy of preference change, this distance minimization way of updating. Now, maybe this is the missing link, right? So under the complementary view, the idea is that meta agreement plus ref rational preference change gives you single plateau. So this is the, the complementary view. But of course, since there's no meta agreement in our model, you can also view it as an alternative hypothesis, which d does away with meta agreement altogether, right? So we really don't need meta agreement. What we need is people just rationally updating their preferences um, uh, rationally uh, or and be open-minded enough. Uh, but of course, the model doesn't give us the tools to adjudicate between these two hypotheses and only suggest them, right? So we would have to actually uh, look into a single peak, uh, how to actually capture the idea of meta agreement. Now, <clears throat> this raises a question which led to follow up work, but I'll go very fast on that. So, this idea that deliberation can uh, create or help avoid. Uh, Inquiry and group reference is part of a gray, a larger literature, especially in philosophy, but also in political theory, uh, which tends to be very optimistic about what deliberation can do. Okay, so there's a number of things that have been proposed in the literature. Deliberation can help us track the truth, find a correct answer, lead to better informed judgment, uh, or so these are good things that deliberation might foster. It's also been claimed that it can help avoid undesirable things. For example, uh, it can provide a counter incentive to misrepresent your preference, just to lie. Uh, so in a nutshell, the argument for that, this is also in dry skin list uh, paper that I quoted earlier, is that uh, because you have to speak for a longer time, you might just get caught. Uh, it's very likely that you will cut, you'll get caught lying if you misrepresent your preference. Uh, and this, uh, <clears throat> this might actually provide a counter incentive for you to, to do that. And of course, that is what I was talking about earlier. So on the one hand, we have a lot of optimism. But if we look at the literature in social psychology about uh, deliberation, it is actually much less optimistic. And, and we also know, I mean, from uh, the, the last five or six years, right, that that massive online group discussion does not always lead to a rosy picture, right? So that, that we know just anecdotally, uh, but there's a lot of work in social psychology that tends that of course, deliberation can also lead to polarization, pluralistic ignorance, while grouping is an older 
term, which has been a question a lot recently in social psychology, but that's was the idea that some information is actually uh, systematic, systematically withheld during deliberation. <clears throat> some people have argued that deliberation um, is not good because it gives an unfair advantage to some pe to people who can speak eloquently uh, or um, the people who just talk a lot. Uh, and something that Soroch did look at earlier on, and uh, we decided to look at here as well, is that deliberation is very, very path dependent. And again, we all know that, I guess, from our experience in serving in whatever committee that you're in, uh, where the order in which the issues are presented can make, or the arguments are presented, can make a huge difference on, on the outcome. So, Sorush, which Stefan Hartmann did look earlier on at uh, this kind of path dependencies as a specific form of it, which is called anchoring, which they call anchoring uh, for probabilistic judgment. And the idea that we decided to look at is, does this happen also for um, preference, uh, deliberation with preference? So what is anchoring? It's a particular form of, that, of path dependencies in which the final judgment, the final collective judgments is closer to the judgment of the person who spoke first in the deliberation than anybody else. Um, <clears throat> and in Tsurush's uh, earlier work, it's actually uh, monotonically closer. So you're, the closest is the first one, the second one is the second, the second person who speaks is the second closest and so on. Right? So that the order speak actually, the order in which the agent speak has a strong influence on what uh, the result of the deliberation is. And the question we're asking is, does it appear uh, here as well? And how does it balance the positive effect that we just um, observe? So the results here are, uh, well, on the one hand, fairly clear. So we do observe some anchoring. Uh, so the importance here is really the, how high are these bars? Right? So between 60 and 40% of the simulations that we run, this is here for a bias of 0.6, they end up being anchors. So that, which means the, the collective preferences at the end is closest to the person who spoke, to the preference of the first speaker at the beginning than anybody else's uh, preferences. Um, so we observed that. So this is for a bias of, of, of 0.6. Um, this, is, uh, this, this figure shows you what happened. So if you fix the group size, uh, but you increase the bias. This is as expected, right? As long as the people change their mind, we observe some anchoring. But if you go to higher bracket le levels, uh, like this here, right? Uh, there are people who essentially stop changing their minds uh, uh, or updating. So there is much less or, you know, anchoring going on. But still, some is observed. Um, and uh, this shows, okay, so what are the pro if you look at the profiles that started to be uh, intransitive and ended up being transitive, so they got cleaned up or cured by deliberation, uh, what is the proportion of them that are anchored? And this is uh, with bias, uh, so with increasing bias here. And you can see that, especially for low bias, a lot of them end up being uh, anchored, especially so low bias means people are very willing to move towards uh, the opinions of the other. So the the person who speaks first carries a lot of influence uh, on them. So we do observe some anchoring. Uh, <clears throat> and of course, it's raised question, like, so what good it is to have uh, coherent preference if they're just anchored or even like copied uh, to those, uh, to the first person who spoke. Uh, so what is the value of, of that? And how do this sets and this pitfall come together? Now, one thing that I should say about that is that we uh, there's a lot of things going on here that we are right now looking into and trying to disentangle. So there is the of the order of speak, of course, but there's also expertise, right? The biases, right? And uh, and we observe, for instance, so just playing with the parameter that if we set up things such that uh, the first speaker has a lower, uh, so if we allow for different biases for each agent. And we observe that the first speaker has a lower uh, expertise than anybody else, then anchoring disappears. So there seems to be a trade-off between anchoring and order of speak. Other things that are important, for example, are, are of 
how frequent is a particular ranking, right? So if the person who speaks first happens to have the same ranking as 80% of the population, of course we'll measure anchoring, right? Uh, so there's a lot of things to, dis to disentangle and we're looking at doing that right now using more sophisticated statistical analysis or going beyond this kind of descriptive statistic that we're doing, uh, but we don't have any results uh, yet uh, on that. Um, now, let me just uh, finish uh, by just saying why I was talking about anchoring right now. So as I said, the starting point of this discussion of anchoring is that on the one hand, there is a lot of optimism, especially in political philosophy and political theory about deliberation. On the other hand, there's pessimism in social psychology. And now the question is, yeah, when and, and, and whether deliberation is actually a good thing, whether we, we should let that happen. Now, if we focus on the problems of aggregation, the one I really started to talk with, then already what our simulation show is that this is not a solution that will solve, this, this is not something that will solve all your problem, but it does under certain conditions. So for if the agents are uh, open-minded enough, help to avoid those uh, aggregation problems. But the, the main take home message of the second, the, what I just presented uh, in the last part is really that we need to, to think thoroughly and assess the drawbacks uh, and the assets of deliberation. So um, now is anchoring really bad if the experts really speak first or uh, if uh, we let people say of underrepresented groups speak first in the deliberation? Uh, so is it really a bad thing? Uh, or if it, if it is bad, then how bad it is with respect to the other advantages that we had uh, regarding uh, <clears throat> Uh, avoiding, uh, say, incoherent group preference. Now, one thing we observe also anecdotally is that uh, under some understanding of what polarization mean, and I can talk about that in the Q&A, there seems to be a connection between polarizing opin of opinions in those deliberations and the formation of incoherent preferences. So, but what is exactly this link that we need to look at? And the question of truth conditiveness is also important. So if we assume that there's a criteria which is independent of uh, the deliberation for assessing the correctness of the uh, group preference, um, then is deliberation helping us to, to uh, getting closer to that criteria? But these are more general questions that we want to look at. Immediately, we're looking at robustness. So we're saying more alternatives, more agents. Uh, and also, we're, I mean, we hope, but this we haven't really started. We hope to, to look at more analytical results uh, going beyond the simulation work because we have some observations, uh, but uh, we don't really understand why they come about, especially this creation of cycles. This is something which is very puzzling and it's very robust. Uh, so we, we they love robustness that this still happens at least for a uh, three alternative. And but the question is why this is the case that this is still not completely clear to us. So this is something that for which analytical result will actually help us. Okay, so um, the source of this talk, if you're interested, um, the main part of the talk is a paper that's recently been published in the American, American Political Science Review uh, by Soros and I. Uh, we have a manuscript, which we're happy to share regarding anchoring, uh, which is not submitted yet. And uh, Maher is writing his uh, master thesis, which should be circulable in a couple of months, uh, where he generalizes uh, or try to look at the results for Maya five or more alternatives. Um, and of course, I should end by thanking, thanking our sponsor. Uh, <laughs> this has been uh, financed by a, a project uh, from the uh, German Science Foundation. Uh, it's a project which is called Cola Form. It was one part of a bigger project, but you can look it up. The project is finished by now, so which was part of it. But if you're interested in looking at what we did and who was in the project, then the website is still on and you can look at it. Okay, that was it. Thank you so much. Thanks very much, Olivia. So now we are open to questions, comments. Ivan. Ivan, please. Uh, thanks. Well, I'm not sure I should go first since I'm probably below the average and uh, the expertise here. But uh, uh, one thing that I, I, I'm not sure that I, I, I got right is what is the uh, explicitly declared purpose of a the ultimate purpose of the deliberation? I mean, do the agents say, all right, let's try to reach single peak preferences or 
how do they state it? I mean, what, when do they, and when, when do they decide that they have reached their goal and the deliberation ends? Yeah, so it's something we left implicit, right? And so in the model, uh, but maybe you can read it off in the way we, we, we design the thing. Um, so the only purpose, as far as the agents have a purpose, I think in this model, in, in our specific model is, is only to somehow accommodate difference of opinions, right? So they come in and they're more or less open-minded. And so I hear your opinion and I thought, oh, okay, so Val knows a lot about this, then uh, it, I'll probably move towards uh, his preferences. So either completely or, or uh, um, partially, so halfway or something like that. This is the only purpose that the agent have. And we stop, we the modelers stop deliberation after a certain round, uh, a number of rounds, not because they achieve their purpose, only typically because they stabilize. So they end up the clustering around a number of, of um, rankings that are too far from one another, given those biases value for providing any more movement. Right. So, um, so this is just what's happening. And this is happening surprisingly fast. But you say that you stop it like the external, the, I mean, the one who is running the experiment, not the people who are deliberating. That no, no, they no. don't reach at some point an agreement that, well, yes, they have. They are. Well, they, they reach, if you want to view it this way, they reach a disagreement typically, right? So, so they, 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 they really, in our model, so if you have 50-50 that they do reach consensus very fast, right? So at 50% bias, but as soon as you go away from this, they don't. Uh, so they cluster. So up to 75, they essentially cluster on two rankings, right? Which are somehow, as I was saying, they're too far away from one another uh, that uh, even if they keep announcing, so I announce my ranking and yours, we will stick to our guns because our, given the bias, the current ranking will always be the one that minimizes distance uh, to, uh, so this weighted uh, distance. So, so the, they actually end, end up disagreeing. And the question is how much are they disagreeing? I mean, this is the question of polarization I was talking about earlier, right? Uh, okay. uh, just a quick follow-up before yeah. uh, I pass to Alexander. So, I can imagine that there may be rounds of the, that is deliberation going in many rounds where they go in some sort of cycles. That is, yeah. they change their, their, their rankings in some cyclic yeah. order so that they never actually reach stabilization. Yeah. Does that happen in, in reality or is it just in our Well, it, it doesn't happen in our model. And I think uh, one of the reasons for that is the simplifying assumption we make that everybody has the same. Uh, so they don't have this sort of, if you think about a typical case where we create a cycle in a system one in which I put all my weight to you and you put all my your weight to me, right? And then we just chase each other. Um, but this is not happening here because we're all as assigning these. So, um, I don't know actually results about uh, characterizing stabilization uh, mm -hmm. for preference ranking. I mean, there. Are <clears throat> what we do is not very, well, it's been conceptually inspired, let me put it this way, by uh, aggregation methods for uh, probabilistic ranking. And there we know uh, necessary and sufficient condition for cycling. Uh, but uh, for preference, I, I actually don't know. So that's a good question, but we don't observe that at all. There is no cycling mm -hmm. here. Um, all right, thank you. I'm coming. Oh, something happened to Sarush. Uh, no, sorry. No, what happened? Sarush, you froze. Oh. Well, not, not on my screen, but. Uh, Can you see me now? Now, yeah, you, yeah. now it's okay. Okay. <laughs> Alexandra, please go on. Uh, okay, I didn't hear you. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, so I, um, I have uh, some old work with Rosmarin and Goldbach, a, a former master student of mine, mm -hmm. in ID relevant. And um, so, and okay, she was on the optimistic side <laughs> that you kind of could um, that, uh, yeah, so, but it, at least that clarified a bit formally what, why, in what conditions you'd expect this at least mathematically, the, this uh, single peakness to be achieved by deliberation. Mm -hmm. And the conditions were essentially when, in fact, they already at some level met agreement already before the deliberation, in the sense that um, 
people, the agents do have some dimension in mind or some criteria in mind without making them explicit or communicating them. Uh, and they judge based on that and they, they form their preferences based on some um, imaginary uh, uh, a perfect <laughs> like yeah. point in that, in that grid, right? In the, along yeah. the dimension. So, um, and then they still might not be single pit in their actual preferences because of many reasons. One is because um, for instance, they don't know all the facts. So for instance, they may be confused, like suppose left to right in politics is left to right. I prefer center because I'm more center, you're more left. So Rush, let's say is right um, with a certain percentage on this axis. But, uh, and then now we have to vote say in the primaries in America for the democratic candidate. Um, and, but the problem is we might be confused about where on this axis the candidates lie uh, because of the, because of the uncertainty and the lack of facts yeah, sure. or even wrong facts like beliefs, yeah. right? So I might um, not know certain things that Biden said and then the liberation was partially a communication. So you tell me that he said that, right? Yeah. So that's a fact. Um, and that, that might, um, might make me locate better mm -hmm. on this axis uh, where, where, the, where each candidate, which increases the, the possibility that we will reach single peak uh, preferences in this underlying dimension left to right. Yeah. Another thing could be, and that's also in her thesis, in Rosmarin's thesis, a way to, um, to uh, suppose we communicate beliefs, not facts. But as we know from our, Robert Aumann's work, if we assume big assumption common prior, which means our beliefs come from some a priori uh, 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 beliefs um, um, common, that are common, uh, so to speak, general ones about what's good and what's bad via different information. So we, my, part, my information partition is different than yours because I got the different information than yours. Uh, then communicating beliefs is a way to implicitly communicating facts, communicating information. Sure. Sure. So if without even thinking about it, you just factor in the facts. So, um, so then uh, again, the liberation you'd expect in exchange of beliefs would expect to increase the, and we prove that it works uh, in some condition, to increase the degree that they can uh, reach the single penis because of, in the end, it clarifies the facts, like um, gives me facts implicitly. So that's another way to, to do it. So I think that's a part of maybe the response to Val is that on one hand, we try to reach, the, the purpose of the liberation is to try to reach agreement, which means, uh, accommodating different opinions of the others, as, as Olivier said, but also it can be also to find new facts, right? We want to find the facts. And um, in practice, there is even worse because people, but that's more illogical, non-rational component. People might not be um, having clear the dimension or the criteria in mind to themselves. So the incoherence might be at the level of my own preferences, even, uh, even if I knew perfectly well who is where, I had perfect information still. So, and then by being criticized for that saying, why do you put uh, this guy like that and this guy like that uh, based on what? I make explicit my own criteria, which by the way happens I think in, 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 committee, uh, in committees. So, um, so then I clarify my own preferences and maybe I change due to that essentially by ex explicit, making explicit the criteria and then I say, hey, it's not good. I mean, I can't do that. I, it doesn't make sense for me to. So I change due to this um, correcting my own irrationality. So these are, this is another purpose of deliberation, which might help. Um, on the other hand, so this is the optimistic side, the, the pessimistic side, which Olivier mentioned already. Um, so for instance, uh, we have a paper, uh, me and Sonia with Rachel Body, another former master student, in which you look at um, um, the so-called curse of the committee. And we try to show that it's rational. That it's completely rational for people to uh, deliberate a lot and in certain conditions not to agree on anything that they didn't agree before already, <laughs> right? Uh, and this is because of a principle of selective hearing. So we formalize this principle of selecting here and that says, well, people might not process the facts uh, uh, fully because uh, they process them in practice in the view of their interests or their preferences. So the preferences might, might actually interfere with the facts. So when somebody says public announcement P like Obama said that I may reject part of it because of my preferences. So then or round up or only extract the information that fits my prior epistemic or non-epistemic preference. Uh, 
and then uh, I get different information from the P, then you get it. Uh, and then we have a formalization for that makes it perfectly rational. As a result, at the end of derivation, people might even get polarized due to this kind of, uh, they each extracts the part of the information that was, um, that fits their own uh, preferences. May not sound rational, but it actually is not irrational in the sense of like, it's a, it's a belief formation that it's not. Um, so I think this rational belief change that Olivier mentions in his talk is also um, an important component uh, of, 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 of achieving or not achieving this kind of uh, agreement. On the other hand, I, I don't see how you can possibly get some kind of a, a meta, a meta uh, agreement uh, without having this, this postulate that there is a prior, there is some kind of prior dimension that, yeah. um, because if you start with radically, completely, there is a belief that have respect no rules and no, no prior meta agreement, then I don't see how you'll ever get it. It's yeah, I mean, up your beliefs. So this is, I think, that assumption I think is implicit also in the empirical literature because there they, <clears throat> um, what they use as a proxy, as I was saying, is is presence in the media. So they look at a number of issues, uh, and they they assume that if an issue was more present uh, in in the media and in the the different aspects of it was more present, then. Uh, <clears throat> There was already more degree of meta agreement prior to deliberation, right? And then they would they so the idea, the underlying thought is that by if it's not the case, and by deliberating it becomes salient. But of course, in both cases, assume that there is something underlying uh, which is look like looks like a meta agreement, right? They just use this proxy to measure whether deliberation actually increases. It. Um, but more generally, I mean, I think Alexander, all the points you're making are are of course, very good and very good answers to the question, why should we deliberate in general? And this point you have about um, making facts explicit uh, and, and um, maybe <clears throat> exchanging information on top of exchanging preference. I mean, to be fair to listen to Isaac, this is also in their paper. I mean, they have a three steps. Uh, um, yeah, yeah, so partially right. we're formalizing what least. Yeah, exactly. Then that exactly. Is, uh, yeah, yeah. The mathematical model. Yeah. And, and but the dialectic where we, which we were taking things here, and, and uh, maybe the source of my answer to, to Val, just to put it in perspective, is that they claim when all of this is done, right, we've reached all the fact, we've exchanged all the fact we could, uh, and and we we um, then there's still this step right from meta agreement to uh, single peakness that need to happen, and this is where, like you were saying, this rationality identifying this ideal peak and then putting your preference along it, right? This is what they claim happened, and this is what uh, you 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 formalize, and. Uh, so the question we're trying to answer here, and this is exactly the question you were asking during the talk, is: uh, but does it take us further than just single peakness, so weak single peakness in this in the strict case? And then the goal, the, the the factor we add to do this is rational preference change uh, here, right? And this is what I was saying to to. This is why my answer, where my answer to to Val was coming from, namely that we are <clears throat> what we're trying to. This, the only goal of the agents is, is to accommodate. So you might think of it, so they have exchanged everything in terms of reasons and information. Uh, and now their preferences are coming in and now they're trying to still find compromise between those things, right? This is the picture that's, that's underlying this. But I mean, of course, all that you said are you know, good reasons why, why to- rational, I mean, how was the argument conceptual? That relates to my question in your talk. Yeah. Um, conceptually, I don't see why rational uh, preference. Uh, no, it's just, it's just a bit of a it, would somehow uh, lead to um, elimination of these uh, two plateaus, right? Yeah, yeah. This is a bit of a mystery for for us as well. Uh, and uh, I mean, part of the explanation is. Um, I mean, I, I think. Yeah. yeah. Uh, the only way I see it is that uh, by insisting, essentially, if our goal, like Val will put it, <laughs> is to eliminate the plateaus, then by deliberation, we can discover reasons to do it. <laughs> it's like, you know, I, 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 I come yeah. up with a, with a new criterion uh, that eliminates your plateau by saying, look, you should distinguish these, these two. Yeah. Uh, you shouldn't be indifferent because there is, and then you, you buy it. You say, okay, <laughs> then, then yeah. You can. Yeah. yeah, yeah, I mean, what we're asking is an even more simple, it's like basic question, right? What is the mechanics in these specific distance minimization rule that 
actually uh, favors single plateau preferences. I mean, this is the, even that we don't understand, right? And then on the then once we have that, then maybe we be in better position to tell an intuitive story or an intuitive mechanism about how this might in real life happen. Maybe along the line you're suggesting, but even the more basic questions, we don't have an answer to that yet. Uh, so, what is in, in the specific mechanism, specific? distance measures that we use and, and minimization rule that we use that, that actually favors single plateaus, for example. Uh, so my has some ideas, uh, and this might have to do with the geometry of, of all these rankings uh, go in, in, in uh, given their distance, but this is still very uh, preliminary, so we don't know. Yeah, well, realistically, I don't see how any kind of uh, new facts or new criteria can eliminate single plateau without eliminating plateaus altogether. So yeah, that could be a rational because essentially, essentially means uh, you force people to make up their minds, yeah. uh, like to, to, to destroy all the ties and uh, in a rational way, because of course, otherwise you will get a, a total chaos also, like no, no, uh, no agreement. So okay. somehow they are forced during the deliberation to find new criteria. To, to break their own ties. <laughs> and yeah. then if they agree on those criteria, then you don't have plateaus at all and you have single pit with one. With yeah. One. yeah, but that's, this is a, again, right? So this, the way we understand and we see these measures, so when we just compute simple examples by hand, it tends to be the other way around. Uh, these, this, this minimization measure, they actually favor indifference uh, uh, and, and tends to, you tend to stick there. Uh, so that's surprising, right? That we all end up being completely different if the, the society is broad enough. Um, but <clears throat> again, I mean, this is something we need to, to look at more closely and we, we haven't done uh, systematically. Yeah. Thank you. Val, you had another question, I think. Uh, yes, I do. Uh, well, first, thank you both. This discussion was quite uh, helpful, but while listening, I realized that I, I'm not sure about one uh, important uh, assumption, whether it's made or not, namely the uh, initial rankings uh, and preferences. Are they common knowledge before the deliberation? Um, I mean, we don't, of course, we don't have a formalization of common knowledge here, uh, but I, well, are I, they I, assumed to be commonly known? No, no, uh, <laughs> right. because, because okay. I mean, I, I, I'm, this is just a single announcement and what are, so my new ranking at each update is only dependent of my current ranking and the one which is announced. Right. So it's not ranking, uh, it's not dependent on the rankings of the other. So it, 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 it but on the other sense. hand, you, you kind of assume uh, that the agents are truly open-minded. That is, they are prepared to change the... Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, we vary that degree, right? So, I mean, if, if you have a bias of one towards you, you're not open-minded at all. Right. Uh, but uh, I, I, can, I can imagine the following situation where the agents are not really open-minded. So everyone has already decided what, what, what their preferences are. But then the, 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 in, in the course of the deliberation, they actually, well, you can assume that they first start by stating their preferences, right? Yeah. So that they can make them common knowledge. Yeah. And thereafter, uh, they are, well, uh, in a sense, they are trying to reach some compromise by, uh, by each one of them deciding on a strategic voting. That is, I mean, to cut my question sure. short, uh, would or can the deliberation not lead to well simulating or amount to, to strategic voting? That is, I don't change my preferences in, in reality, but I see, all right, so I see that the majority is, is leaning that way, so yeah. I better vote that way so that I can achieve better results. Yeah, 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 that's a good question. Uh, there is absolutely no strategizing uh, in, uh, in, in what we have here. Uh, and, uh, and of course there, But, but that's level, precisely, yeah. I think that's precisely why we shouldn't assume the opinion, the preferences to be common knowledge from the beginning, because essentially this amounts to voting before deliberating. And we know that uh, if you allow that, then indeed people will do strategic. Uh, so after that, they will be, right, so be like influenced by other people's. Right. But you cannot forbid it. I mean, everyone can start in the first round by saying, all right, these are my preferences, yeah. right? So that they can become uh, common knowledge after the first. No, but half. if people are uh, influenced by other people's um, preferences, uh, not by 
communicated facts or other forms of deliberation, then essentially when they vote a second time, when they want to agree, they will just rely to the boss or something. Or, well, ideally, or, or uh, just be influenced. And you don't want that to happen because that will actually kill the facts. So if each of us, even while being uh, um, while, while disagreeing on what's or who's the best candidate and maybe forever disagreeing, but um, each of us has some relevant fact that might, might add to the discussion about that candidate, like something that the yeah. others don't know, then you want this out in the open. You want this to yeah. factor in into our yeah. uh, voting yeah. first before we make up their mind, our minds and vote or, or aggregate in some way. If you go it before, then people will be influenced before getting all the facts. Yeah. So as a result, you don't get, and, and you may get strategic voting. Right. So that's not a- um... I, I understand that, but that's why I asked the question with a, 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 the assumption is that the agents are truly open-minded because, I mean, I have been in more, um, many committees where, where the boss states right to the beginning their preferences and opinion, and basically they expect at the end of the deliberation, everyone to agree with them. So this is more like, you know, manipulating the vote or, or, well, rather than really deliberating. That's what they, so. they know about anchoring. Yeah. But, uh... <laughs> right. I should have stopped the discussion now because I know that Olivia has to leave at 12.30 sharp because he had another meeting. So um, I'm sorry about this, but we can discuss this at some other point maybe.